Yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming to our second annual uh, clinical trial symposium. Uh, clinical research and lung cancer personalized approach to cancer care. Uh, I'm David Chisholm, a medical oncologist. Uh, have the opportunity to be the medical director for clinical research for the past three years. Before we begin, I wanted to just uh, take a moment to acknowledge some of the individuals who make tonight possible. Uh, the administration, uh, Scott, Jenny, Tamara. Thank you for your tremendous support and offering your talents for this. The clinical trial team, uh, Susan Ornby, thank you, uh, Jessica Fever, she's been the chair of this committee. Uh, Christina, Holly, Ashley, Lyons, and Emma. Uh, the MC for this program is going to be Catherine, who you will be here to next. I just want to give a couple uh, ideas about uh, the importance of clinical research. I feel, I see all the orange here. <laughs> and I, uh, Knoxville community, we are winning. Indeed, we are. Not only in, in the sense of uh, undefeated team, but also in a manner in which we're uh, offering clinical research for our patients. And I think it's a win win opportunity. And I, I hope you feel uh, that we're winning as well and be a part of this team. Cancer death rates uh, decreased to 2.3% per year on average for uh, males, 1.9% per year for females. This is according to the CIR database. Lung cancer, particularly, the mortality continues to decrease. That's in part uh, due to a uh, decrease in smoking rates, but also the mortality rate has decreased as twice as fast as the incidence rate. So this is due to recent advances in targeted therapy and immunotherapy, which have changed the landscape for the treatment of lung cancer. In the last 10 years, the US Food and Drug Administration has approved up to 20 new medications for this devastating disease and more are coming through clinical research. Uh, molecular, molecular testing makes personalized medicine possible for patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Despite all of the wins we're doing now, we still must remain vigilant. And so uh, at Thompson Oncology, uh, we are offering clinical trials. We have five uh, clinical trials intervention trials for lung cancer at, uh, now. For example, we have a skyscraper trial. They have these little acronyms, skyscraper. It's a phase three study uh, testing anti-tidget drug, teragolimab uh, in combination with a tezolizumab for uh, uh, which pimetrexid for uh, versus standard of care. The goal is to get more people more and get, uh, responsive to immunotherapy. So we're still investigating uh, this and how we can improve uh, lung cancer for our patients. We have a phase two study testing the safety and efficacy of uh, medication specifically for CMET positive non-small cell cancer. Uh, we have a multiple uh, multi-center study evaluating the efficacy and safety of multiple therapies in cohort of patients uh, based on their biomarker status. So my medical oncology colleagues, uh, we have unresectable stage three disease for which we get chemo radiation. And then uh, we give them immunotherapy with the hope of uh, uh, not allowing the cancer to recur. And so we have a phase three study testing the same ideals, but we're trying to match it to the specific uh, targeted mutation that that patient might have. So. In order for us to keep one, we must be vigilant. We must uh, work together to advance clinical research. So we do look forward to hear from doctors Graham, Jen, Ramsey, and nurse practitioner, uh, nurse practitioner Pickle. Uh, we are honored to have uh, Dr. Iams, who's becoming from Vanderbilt. He's uh, moments away. 
And we just hope you have a wonderful evening uh, tonight. And again, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Chisholm. Okay, so my name is Catherine and I'm your host tonight. Welcome to the second annual Clinical Trial Symposium. Um, I'm going to start with the raffle. All right, so get your tickets out. All right, so if you have the ticket 283343, anybody? You are the winner, Ashley. <laughs> All right, and tonight's first speaker is Dr. David Graham. He is a board certified cardiothoracic surgeon and has 15 years of experience. He graduated from Albany Medical College and then did his general surgery residency and cardiothoracic fellowship at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Please welcome Dr. David Graham. Thank you so much. So I did a lot of my training in Texas. Uh, I was born in Texas. Uh, I was in the military for a while. Thank you. Uh, and I um, always thought we'd come to the South uh, after training, after, you know, separating. Uh, it wasn't a part of a big school. So, you know, coming here in ball country has been pretty awesome. I'd say it's pretty hard not to love uh, the, the volunteers and just the excitement and the energy. I mean, just look in here. It's like orange everywhere. I'm going to have to get an orange tie just to compliment the blue. Um, so I hope this this kind of takes away some of the anxiety that we're going to have tomorrow. Uh, I nearly had a heart attack with Alabama. I took care of a patient at Fort Sanders who did have a heart attack <laughs> at the game, fortunately doing well. Um, so uh, hopefully that's not me. I'm a little worried about tomorrow, but uh, I'm hoping just to give a thoracic surgery perspective to you know early stage lung cancer um, and just talk about the role of a thoracic surgeon in this uh, day of age, it's, it's come a long way and it's really changed. Um, there's still a lot of variability. This is kind of a community center, um, but you know, we have a big UT center across all that very academic and I, you know, we all study in academic places, but Thompson really kind of feels like an academic you know, setting as well. And I think that's really amazing. I'm very proud to be part of the team uh, at, at Fort Sanders and the Thompson uh, to really kind of help in this arena and, you know, who, think that we'd be talking about early stage lung cancer and surgeons having a role with biomarkers and other things. And so we'll touch on some of that, but it's pretty exciting. Thank you for putting that slide in. Hopefully the slides made it sort of through. So, you know, what is a thoracic on a surgical oncologist, the role of a surgeon in a cancer center? You know, we feel that, you know, multidisciplinary tumor boards are really standard care should be, um, and unfortunately are not done in every setting, but uh, clinical trials certainly are a big mainstay of that. And then just touching on some biomarker-driven pathways in early stage lung cancer. Obviously, this is exploding, and I can't, I'm not touching everything, but just giving some ideas. So, you know, that's uh, James Ewing, you know, pioneer in pathology over in New York, and that's the old Memorial Hospital um, in New York City that really kind of started oncology um, in, in the study of it. Uh, and, and I'll touch on that. So, you know, WebMD, surgeons with a specialty training and procedures for diagnosing, staging, and removing, that's pretty like standard. It's kind of stupid though. It really isn't talking about what a thoracic surgeon really is. Um, the Society of Surgical Oncology was born from James Ewing and a group that was started uh, at Memorial. Uh, and it evolved into the Society of surgical oncology, which is a big foundation that, you know, in a group that really pushed for better care of cancer patients. Um, early on, surgeons were the only ones to treat lung cancer or treat cancer in general. It really wasn't, you know, the thought was we got to cut it out, right? Just whatever it is, cut it out. A lot of people didn't do well because they were advanced stage and, and probably shouldn't have been operated on. But that's what all, all we knew how to do. And then x-rays came you know, uh, on board and 
modern chemotherapy around World War II really started making a turning point and many surgeons adopted to those changes. And interestingly, a lot of surgeons ended up going into x-ray fields and radiology and going into chemo, um, and, and, but many didn't. And obviously you go through training, you go through this rigorous training. And so of course, a lot of surgeons were like, I'm gonna leave that to them. I'm gonna do my own thing and just be you know, a, a surgeon. Um, this is kind of a, a plot of just surgical oncology that I, I took from a variety of uh, lectures that some of the presidents of this surgical oncology group have given. But, you know, the main thing is working as a team, um, you know, knowledge, oncology, uh, being effective, you know, treating cancer, using techniques. So James Ewing Society started in 1940. Um, basically to further the knowledge about cancer and also kind of an alumni association of those that came out of Memorial Hospital in New York. Eventually they let other people in. It was you know, an elite group, but you know, eventually let others throughout the country in that, that were really dedicated, dedicated to cancer uh, therapy. So they first started uh, having an annual meeting in 1948 and then Jane, uh, Glenn Leak in his presidential address in 1966, so 18 years later, basically summed it up as, you know, the overall death rate for most cancers not appreciably, appreciably altered. Pretty amazing, you know, 18 years really didn't have a, a profound effect on overall cancer survival. And his motto was, you know, at the end of this talk was Optima Futura, the best is yet to be. And, you know, fortunately that's the case, but a couple of little things that stand out here, you know, talking about, um, we blithely went along teaching, I mean, the verbiage they use is just awesome, uh, that cancer can only be cured by surgery and x-ray and that no cure, cancers were cured by chemotherapy. Um, the studies conclude that members of this society that cigarette smoking is a major factor in production of lung cancer. There you go. I mean, 1966, they're talking about this. Um, here's truly preventative medicine. Unfortunately, no one heeds the call. Um, and then finally, you know, recent evidence to show that early detection of asymptomatic cancers yields the highest five-year cure rates. Hey, that's lung cancer screening right there. I mean, this is all, you know, just profound at that time. Um, and then combining these modalities, we have given comfort and palliation to many. Um, we have not added, you know, we may not have added time to life, but added life to time. I think it's kind of a neat way of doing some of the things we do. But um, Edward Scanlon was a, a profound surgeon is a surgical oncologist that uh, we have whole instrument sets that are, you know, Scanlon instruments that kind of pay homage to him. But, you know, the cancer surgeon, I thought this was a really interesting, he was one of the presidents of the society and gave, you know, a discussion about, you know, what is a surgical oncologist? What does that really mean? And it's not just somebody that has some techniques and we can cut cancer out and treat it and diagnose it. It's a little bit more, right? And so, the full-time effort really is needed to be applied to cancer. And that sets really apart a surgical oncologist from a surgeon who does cancer surgery. Um, so, you know, half the qualifications he said is being a good sound surgeon, but the other half of the qualifications is found in the fields of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, you know, possessing the knowledge of how they complement surgical treatment. I think that's just really, really sums it up. I mean, you, you, you want somebody that's involved with a surgical aspect that is, is part of that community uh, around us. Being involved in non-operative management and continuously being trained. So, you know, do I see a lot of patients that I don't think are surgery candidates? Yeah, I do. And I think it's my duty to offer those other non-operative treatment modalities and talk about them in tumor boards to really make sure we're giving them standard of care. But it's very common that I, I'm involved with that. Medical oncology, surgical oncology, uh, sort of initially kind of drifting apart, you know, surgeons dabbled, but eventually returned back to the OR. Medical oncology kind of looked on drug evaluation early on as a first priority with objective measurements. And this is kind of what he summed up as surgeons were more willing to accept subjective improvement in patient conditions. So that was kind of interesting. Um, in 1975, half the schools had surgeon, and now pretty much every, every school does. So the role of a thoracic surgeon in a cancer center, you know, I think number one, attend tumor board. You know, you can't really 
promote change and, and have that discussion if you're not there. Uh, I, I think, you know, as thoracic surgeons, we're sometimes divided between heart surgery and lung surgery. And certainly in the community, the thrust is, is mostly for heart surgery, which is very noble. I mean, it's a fun field. Um, but I, I think you really have to be dedicated to the treatment of lung and, and esophageal and chest cancers and attend these meetings because it is, I learn a lot every time I go. And, and I think it's really just important um, be a colleague to all parties. You know, we, we obviously it's a, a big group of folks with the oncologists, um, other surgeons in the room, nurse navigators, uh, which you know do a huge role. Uh, radiology pathologists. It's just a great opportunity. So the oncologic surgeon must join with his colleagues and other disciplines. Failure to become a member of the therapeutic team initially will make it more difficult to join with that team in an effective manner at a later time. But again, another one of those presidents. I gave a little discussion about his thoughts. Um, Multidisciplinary team. So advocate for the patient, which I think is first and foremost. I think surgeons differently see things in a different manner. I mean, you know, you've all met surgeons, they're kind of an odd lot. And they, you know, we often do see things a little bit differently. You know, we, we look at patients on how can we get them, think we can get them through an operation, how, you know, that whole eyeball test of how do they look in the office and walking. Um, it would just come in with a little different perspective on, on the care for the patient, but I think it's in a good way, I hope. And then just be a resource, you know, be available to answer questions and, and you know, for, for a variety of other patients that come in, um, just another sounding board. I, I hope to kind of do that, um, provide that role too. So discuss staging, reviewing NCC and guidelines, uh, providing treatment options, Identifying patients for clinical trials, you know, and that's one big thing in tumor board. Uh, outcomes improved, you know, and there actually have been some studies on this, and and you know, five systemic reviews uh, was done in this paper in 2020. Uh, and there were 16 to 50 studies in each of those uh, systemic reviews um, in all cancers, but the diagnosis they found it was more accurate staging and, and assessment, better treatment, more appropriate and tailored. Uh, survival, and it wasn't so hot on whether folks did better or not, but quality of life, satisfaction, scores, waiting times, I think all of those do improve, um, and there's numerous times in our, in our uh, group that I think, you know, when you're talking about what next steps need to be done, the pulmonologist is sitting right next to you, and you're like, hey, I need this EBIS, and, and they, um, you can just jump on that and, and get the ball rolling. Uh, it's really the best, you know, way to deliver complex care, and so uh, I think it is vital um, uh, aspect of any cancer center. So the impact of um, on lung cancer outcomes, we talked briefly about this in our tumor board, uh, but you know, in Roswell Park in New York, 4,000 patients, 20% 20 per, 20 referred to a tumor board, treatment planning, new advent, you know, all those kind of questions um, that they wanted answered. Um, and 41% that there's a change in, in care plans, in, in CC and guideline, compliance rates significantly improved. I mean, isn't that what we're about is following the guidelines and making sure that we're giving the patient best care that we know. I and mean, that, that, that's why the guidelines are there. Um, and then showed improvement in overall survival, mainly in the higher state groups, not surprisingly, but that was probably on folks that needed that therapy that probably was not going to get that therapy if they weren't presented to that board. Um, so, you know, joining clinical trial, I think that that is, you know, kind of what we're here to talk a little bit about in, in this clinical trial symposium and, you know, why join? Well, there's cutting edge treatment, there's frequent interactions with doctors, closer follow-up and more attention to details, options for patients with advanced cancer that may didn't respond well, helps other cancer patients in the scientific medical community and helps guide for future trials. So it's building blocks, so building and building and building on more and more. And, and why is that important in lung cancer? Well, our survival rate's terrible. I mean, you look at all the other um, you know, uh, common cancers and, you know, currently prostate and breast, pretty good survival rates and lung is terrible. So what do we need to do? You know, um, we need to know what trials are out there. You know, if you don't know what is out there, it's hard to advocate for your patients. We need to uh, discuss at tumor boards um, and we need to increase funding. You know, it, this was something that came through uh, I think cancer.gov, but it was talking about, you know, how much lung cancer funding research there is in 2020. 
and it's 411 million a year, you know, compared to, you know, breast cancer and, and HIV, it's just sounding that it's not more, especially since it's the number one cancer death in America. Um, however, smoking <laughs> spending is on the order of 8 billion. So, I mean, like it's a, why can't you just funnel that money to where it's needed? Uh, we could get patients that, that bottom right is, is, I guess was in a, uh, a video game, so it's not real. Um, smooth taste, expected mother's grade. But I'm a Formula One fan, so you know we got you know th this was big back in the day. You know, talking about you know um, the excitement of you know smoking. Obviously, we got the Marlboro Man, Texas, uh, partly Montana. I don't know. Um, he just won two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Poured a bucket of champagne over his head. He's not going to follow all that with a boring cigarette. It's just crazy what, what we were peddled back in the day. Um, so clinical trials, there are a lot of actually surgeon-led ones, and, and, and I think that was mainly what I wanted to focus a little bit on. And the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group was started in 1999 and mainly focusing on breast, gastrointestinal, and thoracic disease. There are many thoracic trials, and they looked at accuracy of early lung cancer staging, resection techniques of stage one, locally advanced adeno um, carcinoma of the esophagus, um, and then a couple of these Z trials that, you know, looking at mediastinal lymph node staging versus, uh, or sampling versus dissection. Um, looking at pet accuracy for stage one, which is not as good. Uh, and then um, in 2014, looking at sub-lobar sub resection with brachiotherapy. Didn't really work out so well. Obviously, I, I don't do any of that currently. Um, and it, it really didn't catch on, and did not really have any advanced, um, uh, improvement in overall survival, but it's interesting, you know, we're trying to push the boundary a little bit. And then, you know, the more recent one, high risk stage one, non small cell lung cancer patients treated with, with radiofrequency ablation. And there's other ones that are, that are coming down. So um, other surgeon led initiatives, obviously, can we get better and, you know, from open to minimally invasive surgery, this whole robotics kick, it's huge. Everybody's jumping on it. I am too. It's kind of fun. It's like a video game. And that's kind of, what there it says, oh, Mr. Smith, we'll get started as soon as I finish my warm up. And it looks like he's playing some Forza or, you know, Grand Theft Auto or something up there. Um, it, it, it's fun. It's just, I don't know, it, it, but it does improve patient um, uh, satisfaction, uh -huh. it's less mortality, less length of stay. Um, so it actually does show an improvement for our patients, which I, I do think is key. And I think it's a little easier referring patients to surgery when they know that they're not going to get, you know, sliced open. Um, and, and they, they know about lung surgery, they know about thoracotomies, and they're not pleasant. So some other kind of surgeon-led things here, um, Siva Tech, this is, you know, a, a, a kind of, again, brachiotherapy, again, we're kind of coming back to it, uh, but there's a trial going now and, uh, in NYU looking at placing this specialized chemo or radiation therapy uh, patch, if you will, on areas of lung, or on the chest wall, perhaps, if you have a resection and you want to deliver uh, specific radiation to just one targeted area, it has gold, these gold-plated things that help shield that radiation from going, it kind of makes it unidirectional. So kind of neat, kind of exciting. Um, and so uh, there's this NIH-sponsored trial that has to look at that. Uh, you just put in, you know, clinical trials and clinicaltrials.gov, there's a, there's a plug for them. Uh, you know, these are some of the things that are actively in there now. Robotic bronchoscopy with, you know, cone CT and this, and this special called ICG. It's a kind of a, a marker, kind of like methylene blue, uh, but is going intravenously and, and you, it highlights, you know, things that are giving blood and perfusion um, to aid lung resections in patients with early stage uh, lung cancer. Um, this one I thought was interesting, comparing the effect of coronary vein versus pulmonary vein first ligation versus the pulmonary artery first ligation uh, in decreasing circulating tumor DNA. And I can talk a little bit more circulating tumor DNA, but um, it is, that sounds kind of fascinating. And then action lung, you know, active surveillance and early lung cancer, patients that are too high risk and, you know, what if we just watch them? But um, biomarker driven pathways, finally, you know, in early stage lung cancer, you know, it, it's really exciting to be able to, to offer patients that I see uh, some opportunities to help them live longer and better. Um, usually that's meant for folks that in, in the past when we were doing training had 
lymph node disease, then they go to medical oncology and, and, and um, have that option for adjuvant therapy. This is pretty cool that stage one and two lung cancer patients have some options that have never really been out there before. Um, we do know recurrence rates are, even for early stage cancers, fairly high. Um, chemotherapy was really not beneficial to early you know, stage one cancers, um, but it was stronger for those patients in 2A and beyond. So how can we target those young early kind of stage patients uh, that are those high risk ones that are gonna recur? And, and so these are the conversations we're starting to have. And obviously with the biomarker you know, pathways that are out there, there's, there's tons of these driver mutations and that we're finding more and more in. And there's a lot of studies that are looking at that. So in our guidelines, um, you know, stage 1B, 2A and 0, chemotherapy for high-risk patients. You know, 2A, chemotherapy for high-risk. So what does that mean? You know, high-risk in, in the NCC, NCC and guidelines is poorly differentiated tumors, vascular invasion, wedge resection only, greater than 4 centimeters, plural, uh, visceral plural involvement, and then unknown lymph node status. There's not a lot in there about biomarkers and stuff, but you might start finding that, you know, creeping into the guidelines, which would be helpful as these studies are coming in. So just a few of the ones that are just, are out there, just kind of finished Empower uh, O1O was, was, you know, has re recently showed that, you know, the group that was in that PDL one over 1% had a benefit. And so um, we're, we're getting, you know, obviously some improvement in those type of patients. Adura, uh, mainly for the DGFR, and then Alchemist is, those were immunotherapy alone, but Alchemist is using chemo in patients that had ALK and DGFR, and I believe also pd one but um, looking at chemo plus IO. So, you know, we're going to see more and more of these mutations uh, have um, studies that go along with that to really further uh, this question of how can we get those high-risk patients treated. Another one that I've actually been using uh, as well as this oncocyte, it's kind of oncotype like for breast and colon, but it's, it's for lung and uh, 14 gene assay uh, that um, 11 of them are, are real genes, the three are just um, controls, but you know, looking at stage 1A, 1B, 2A adenocarcinomas uh, and you know, validated that in this assay, and it's proprietary, they don't tell you, you know, what, genes are abnormal and whatnot, but based on their assessment, they had high risk, intermediate, and low. As you can see, the high and intermediate risk didn't do as well. So it was kind of risk stratifying a certain cohort of very early stage lung cancer patients and, um, and finding that if you treat them, their uh, um, freedom from recurrence and survival, these three survival are actually back up to you know, the baseline if, if you're low risk. So pretty, pretty amazing. And so um, I have sent some of my patients for that, uh, about 28% when I last I counted, um, which is a fairly, fairly good amount of, of those surgical patients. 57 um, of those were low risk and um, the others were intermediate or high. Um, all but one chose to uh, proceed with adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and so I think it's just important to discuss results with patients. It's helpful to give them some numbers. Um, I love this, this cartoon, you know, lifelong smokers have one and two chance of dying from smoking related disease and oh, it'll never happen to me. And the odds of winning the Powerball lottery now it's like one point something billion, right? Or, um, are 80 million to one. And he's like, oh, it could be my lucky day. And I mean, that's really how patients think, they really do. It's not, not that far off. So really in conclusion, you know, current thoracic surgical oncologists have evolved from just being proceduralists and cutting out tumors to really becoming cancer surgeons that help guide the patient towards really the best evidence-based cancer care. Tumor boards, I think, are just really vital to providing that individualized cancer care that has been proven to help you know, with, with staging treatment and care plans um, and in select patients help overall survival. Uh, surgeons need to be an active participant with the cancer center. Um, uh, clinical trials are really vital to help understand lung cancer so we can treat it more effectively. Uh, we need to really risk stratify patients with high risk features you know, using molecular studies. The oncocyte is just another you know, opportunity, but there are many other ones out there, and there's other studies that are coming down the pipe at, you know, all the time to really help us answer that question. So it's pretty exciting. 
and biomarker driven pathways in early lung cancer up and coming will be a major force. Obviously, it's not going away and it's just going to continue to evolve. Uh, and all this, you know, in the setting, um, setting the stage for, you know, changing guidelines, which I think will help. You know, obviously, we follow guidelines pretty, you know, pretty adherently. We do feel that's important, but, you know, how much is that really done in the community until, until we get, you know, the guidelines changed to really show these benefits? It's not going to really trickle down. So I think, you know, really making a big push for, for making those um, changes in guidelines will be, will be key. And then, then we might be able to move the needle. That's kind of what that was. Move the needle um, to the right to help, you know, lung cancer survival. It, it is pretty dismal. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for lung improvement. So November, lung cancer awareness. We, we see it, it's, it's great you had all those things. I'm gonna definitely have one of those little retractable things. And that's awesome. But any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Yes, sir. Hey, hi, Dr. And Tony Masala, we spoke on the phone. Yes, sir. Yeah. So when you're determining who to send a determinant study on, what, obviously you wait for the pathology. Then what makes you choose which uh, stage one patients or stage two patients to send it on? I mean, if they're if they're state if they're one A one B or two A, I I to give them the steel. I just talk to them about it and say, you know, based on the data, based on what we see, I think you'd be a candidate. Now they're adenocarcinomas or adenosquamous, they will do, but it's not for squamous only. So that, that does limit some of your patients, uh, but I know it's the most common. So, you know, we do see a fair amount of that. I think they can do a few other subtypes, but that's really what, what the tests were validated for. So pretty much anybody in that range, I will talk to them about it and, and get their um, their thoughts. If they say it doesn't matter what it shows, I don't want chemo. I, I don't, you know, will it really help them? I don't know. Sometimes if patients know, oh, it's low risk, it may give them a little bit more peace of mind that okay, you know, it, it should I should be okay. But then if it comes back as high risk and they don't want chemo, I don't know. Do you do more surveillance? I don't think you really figured that out much, but. <laughs> Common, I mean, which you're on the other side, the guy to do it. And once it came back, he said, Yeah, fine. He had to have a uh, EGFR mutation, it's easier. But uh, yeah. that, that particular thing actually worked on that patient. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I think I think the data is very compelling. I mean, that's why I think, you know, again, we have to advocate for that. And I feel it's my duty to advocate for that. You know, and, and otherwise, these patients, I would just say, I'll surveil you, I'll just see you in six months. Usually don't send them to medical oncology when you guys are inundated with so many patients. You know, if it's not something that needs chemo, we usually save one, don't really send them. But I think this is a perfect opportunity where you're identifying a higher risk feature. And it's not in the NCNC NCC guidelines, but maybe will be someday. And that's an you know, should be an automatic, you know, referral. Yes, sir. Oh, I was wondering uh, where you trained did they have a tumor micro board? Uh, you know, health oncologists, practice surgeons, up to date on the you know, pace of discovery. And that's one of the challenges. Uh, how many know about the terminal acts? You know, um, yeah. so I'm just wondering how can you keep your information? Uh, that's a, that's a you know yeah, this has exploded. I mean, I did my training in gosh, you know, 2011. Um, there wasn't a lot of molecular stuff out there. If it was, it was for advanced stage. You know, we weren't. It was we were never really privy to much of that. And I think that's the, the really the basis for learning, right? I mean, in surgeons, our field changes a lot with techniques, and and certainly all of our fields are. You know, we we don't learn any of this in medical school, and it's as we go along, the pace of medicine is just exponentially going. And so there really wasn't any of that. So a lot of, you know, this kind of, can we give an opportunity for a patient like the trauma comes from either surgeons on their own, researching, reading journals, looking into, you know, the up and coming activities, going to conferences and such. Um, but it requires a surgeon that wants to learn about lung cancer. And like I said, a lot of, a lot of thoracic surgeons, you know, focus on heart. And when you go to the meetings, they go to the heart stuff and leave because they're, they're at the same time. That's the other things that's silly about conference, 
heart and lung are the exact same thing. You gotta choose. Um, and so it does require someone that's interested in lung cancer and wants to learn this stuff because it does change. It, uh, I, I'm, you know, I am no expert on, on biomarker pathways. It's amazing how much it's just exploded. And I think it's important to stay with the finger on the pulse because it, it is constant. And before too long, you're, you're going to be underwater and can't figure it all out. But I think um, going to tumor boards has been great as well because that's where you also learn about these, these other drugs and these other medications that, that help with these mutations. But um, I think it's just staying driven and saying, you know, knowing that this helps our patients and it's my it's kind of like my duty to, to stay up on it as much as you can. And obviously, I appreciate the help with our medical oncology team to really, you know, help the, the dumb surgeons stay, uh, stay in the mix because it's, it's, it is a lot. It's a lot of info and it's, um, it's certainly exciting. All right, next we have next we have Dr. Shin. Dr. Brian Shin is a radion, radiation oncology specialist and brings more than 18 years of experience in Knoxville. He graduated with honors from Loma Linda University School of Medicine in 2004 and also did his residency training at Loma Linda. Please welcome Dr. Shin. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you tonight about uh, proton therapy uh, in the setting of lung cancer. Um, I moved here about a year, a little more than a year ago. And, uh, you know, I was in Loma Linda doing my proton training for many years. Um, I moved to South Bend, Indiana, and I was there in private practice for many years too, and came here uh, about a year and a half ago. So I went from one huge football town to another. And, um, you know, you can't really compare South Bend and Knoxville. However, I feel like the sort of the football fervor was equivalent, despite, despite South Bend's small, uh, it's being a smaller population. They were very into their football team. And uh, um, and so I, I appreciated what a good football team does at, uh, for a community. And uh, uh, every other, almost every other patient, it seems like since I've been here in Knoxville, they're asking me, so, you know, are you, you a football fan? Uh, well, I mean, kind of, yeah. You know, I, I support the volunteers. And so they go, okay, okay, okay. So, you know, it's like, it's like, like, whoa, okay, you know, uh, but, uh, but no, we, we, uh, this is an exciting time, I guess, for all of us. Um, I just got here, and so, I don't know, apparently, Tennessee hasn't been good for a long time, and finally, it's like, that's changed, and so, we, 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 we appreciate it. <laughs> I'm glad to experience this with you all, um, but uh, I wanted to, uh, so tonight, I wanted to talk about uh, proton therapy uh, and lung cancer. Now, we are in the Thompson Cancer Survival Center. This is also the Thompson Proton Center. So um, someone needs to talk about proton therapy. I would think. And might as well be me, okay? So let's, let's, uh, oh, yes, thank you for putting that in. I have no uh, financial relationship to this post. Okay, so before we go on talking about uh, lung cancer, I just wanted to touch base a little bit, some basics on proton therapy. Uh, so uh, what is the rationale for proton therapy? Um, all tumors have what we call a dose response curve to radiation therapy. So um, let me see, yeah. So um, what do I mean by that? So 
typically there's some radiation dose that we need to achieve, uh, and we look on this side, percent tumor control. We need some radiation dose that uh, give us, uh, uh, whether it be 75%, 80%, 90% percent tumor control. So every tumor has sort of this dose response curve. However, on the flip side, every surrounding normal tissue to the tumor has a, also has a dose response curve. And uh, here we think about, okay, what radiation the dose uh, will be associated with incidence of uh, normal tissue complications. So how much radiation would cause a 25% or 30% risk of uh, tissue complications. So this, this sort of interplay uh, limits us radiation oncologists sometimes from being able to deliver effective dose in certain situations. So if we have a tool or a modality that allows us to have more conformality of our radiation, we can uh, deliver the radiation more closely to the tumor, which would allow us to deliver higher doses of radiation while still protecting uh, normal tissue and uh, keeping the risk of uh, normal tissue complications uh, at an acceptable level. So this is, uh, this curve sort of compares uh, conventional radiation. And for those who are not in radiation, we use uh, conventional X-ray radiation or photon interchangeably. So those two, both of those terms are sort of, uh, 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 interchangeable. And so we have an X-ray or photon, and this is the X-ray curve. Um, and uh, some of the limitations of conventional X-ray radiation is that uh, it can only be controlled in two dimensions. So what do I mean by that? So if we have, let's say somewhere in your body, you've got tumor uh, located here in your body, and uh, we have conventional radiation coming in from this direction, uh, what tends to happen is you get this dose buildup region just beneath the skin surface. And so just beneath the skin surface is where you get your maximum dose of radiation being delivered. This is conventional X-ray radiation. And as you traverse through the body, as you get closer to your target, which here in this case is the tumor, by the time you get there, you get maybe, I don't know, half, 40% of the dose being delivered to your tumor as you did on the way in. And we all know how x-rays work. Anyone who's gotten a chest x-ray knows how it works. It goes through and through you, right? So once you pass through the tumor, the radiation dose continues and we call this exit dose. So you have radiation, additional radiation dose being delivered on the way out, okay? So because of the characteristic of conventional x-ray or photons, um, one of the limitations is you can't control where the maximum radiation is delivered. So in this case, the maximum radiation is delivered here under the skin surface, but that's nowhere near our target. Um, and then again, this again talks about how you can't stop radiation once it passes through the, uh, through the target. So what does this look like practically? Okay, usually when we do radiation treatment planning, we do CT-based planning and uh, this is what it would look like if we were to do x-ray radiation coming from one direction. Uh, so let's say we have someone here, let's say they have lung cancer, this is our target, let's just say. And, uh, and the radiation, let's say it's coming in an anterior posterior direction like this. Um, and so what would happen if you came in one direction is most or all, most of your radiation would be delivered just underneath the skin surface. And by the time you traverse through the body, by the time you get to your target here, you're getting maybe half the dose. And then of course you get additional exit dose on the way out. So this causes more radiation exposure to where we don't necessarily want it, which is in uh, normal lung tissue, spinal cord, uh, ribs, vertebral body, uh, et cetera. So, so, this, so this here, this is not practical. We, we cannot treat anyone like this because this has absolutely no therapeutic benefit. You're getting all your dose where you don't need it and you're getting only uh, you know, sub, uh, sub uh, threshold treatment here. 
Um, so how do we how do we do it with conventional X-rays? Uh, the way we do this is we have to come in multiple directions. Um, so you can't just come in one or a few directions. You have to come in basically many different directions. So the, each of these are sort of low dose radiation fields, and where they all intersect is where the high dose region is ordered. Um, so this is how we, we do conventional X-ray radiation. You can deliver effective dose here. However, that comes at the cost of sort of this bath of additional low-dose radiation sort of all the way around. Um, so you get a lot of radiation dose in the ipsilateral lung. You get quite a bit of radiation exposure in the, in the heart. And then you can see there's quite a bit of low-dose radiation being delivered even in the uh, contralateral lung. And again, this is because why the characteristic of, of X-ray is that go through and through. You cannot stop it on your target. All these low dose beams go through the other side. So if we compare that to proton therapy, uh, the advantage of proton therapy is that it can be controlled in three dimensions. So what we have here is in comparison, if your target is here, uh, a beam of proton penetrates the skin, and what it typically does is it would start off uh, as low dose, and then we calculate so that the proton beam stops on your target or your cancer, and wherever the proton beam stops, this is where you get this maximum dose of radiation being delivered, and we call this the Bragg peak phenomenon. And because it stops, that's where it ends, and you don't have this um, what we call the exit dose uh, associated with proton therapy. Um, so sort of the so, so the advantage of proton therapy is basically here and here. Um, the simple way to say this is you get more radiation where you need it and less where you don't need it, which is on the way in and on the way out. Okay, so if we were to uh, do a similar treatment, this is what a proton uh, treatment plan would look like. So we, of course, wouldn't come in as many directions. In this case, you can see that we're coming in, uh, looks like one, two, and three directions. Um, and uh, we're able to achieve the same high dose since we're using a modality, uh, a radiation modality that stops on your target. Uh, we're able to protect more of the surrounding normal tissue. So more of the ipsilateral lung, you have more cardiac sparing. And then here you can see you pretty much completely spared the, uh, uh, the contralateral lung. And then if we just sort of put those two treatment plans side by side, you can kind of see that, uh, again, you've got quite a bit of radiation exposure in the contralateral lung with X-ray radiation therapy. Uh, more cardiac dose and more ipsilateral lung dose. And this is important, uh, especially in folks who have lung cancer. A lot of times they've got pre existing um, uh, COPD, so they already have low lung, lung reserves to begin with. And with lung tissue being exquisitely sensitive to low, even low doses of radiation, uh, being able to spare lung tissue in that setting uh, becomes quite important because even low dose radiation here can cause irreversible scarring or uh, irreversible lung damage. And this can be important for someone who already has low lung reserves. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about proton therapy, some of the basics. Um, now uh, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about uh, lung cancer. And let's start with uh, stage one lung cancer. Um, so I wanted to show this study. Uh, this is a study that I participated in at Loma Linda University back when I did my training, uh, hypofractionated proton beam radiotherapy for stage one lung cancer. Um, now, you can see I'm right here. You see that right there? I'm in third position. Okay. So when you're in training, you can never get first position. Even though you do 90% of the work, you're not going to get first position. 
And then uh, this, this guy right here, he's the chairman of the department at the time. He still is. So if you're a chairman, you're automatically you get second position no matter what you do. Okay. So should I have been second position? Probably, but you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Okay. And this is what, 15 years ago? I'm not bitter. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I bring up this, this study not because I was involved in it, although that may be a small reason. Uh, the, the, the main reason I bring this up is because this study originated at Loma Linda University. Now, at the time uh, when we did our training, Loma Linda was one of the few proton centers in the United States. And uh, so a lot of the clinical trials of the early experience with proton therapy started at Loma Linda. Uh, the follow-up, a lot of the follow-up uh, for clinical trials tend to be a much longer at Loma Linda University uh, clinical studies, uh, and they tend to have more patient accrual. So the update to this study that I was involved in was published in uh, 2013. And uh, so this was a phase two prospective study of 111 patients. That's quite, that's actually quite a lot of patients. Most other studies are 60, 50, or maybe as high as 80, but uh, over 100 is one of the bigger ones that I've seen. So we looked at 111 patients with stage one non-small colon cancer. They were medically inoperable uh, due to uh, comorbid medical condition, or they just refused surgery for whatever reason. And so what we did is we treated, we treated these patients with 10 treatments um, in escalating doses of 51 gray, 60 gray, and 70 gray. So for those who, who are not in radiation, uh, um, you know, the, the way we measure radiation is in gray. Uh, so so the early experience started with 51. Um, and when we established the safety of that treatment, we increased it to 60. Um, and when we found that we had room to improve, we increased it to 70 gray in 10 fractions, in 10 treatments. So we, our results are pretty good for your overall survival increase with increasing dose level. And this makes sense. So for the 70 gray arm uh, or for the 70 gray patients, uh, we had 51% for your overall survival. Uh, we had a 96% local control for favorable peripherally uh, located T1 tumors. And uh, uh, one particular impressive uh, statistic here is that there was no, uh, there were no clinically relevant radiation meningitis that required steroids out of all these 100. So that's quite impressive. Uh, most other studies uh, will have at least a single digits or uh, 10, 11 percent uh, uh, meningitis requiring uh, steroids. Uh, this is another, another study uh, out of Japan. Uh, so they, this is a prospective study of 80 patients. Uh, so not as many, but uh, still a good number. Uh, stage one, non-small cell lung cancer, medically inoperable for refused surgery. And they were treated with uh, particle therapy. So either proton or carbon ion, and they were treated 60 gray in 10 fractions. Uh, they also had pretty good results, three-year overall survival of uh, 75%, constant typical survival 86%, local control 82%. And they had a 11% grade two meningitis, 2% uh, grade three meningitis. What, what were the three year markers in your study? Mm -hmm. Because that's a big jump. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think we specifically looked at three year over survival, but uh, ours was more than four. And four. Yeah. I, mean, I wish we could all do apples and apples across all studies, but sometimes everyone has sort of their own. They want to pick their own measurement, <laughs> whether it be two year or three year or four year. Uh, okay, so this is a meta-analysis comparing uh, proton, uh, stereotactic hypofractionated proton with, uh, with uh, SDRT or X-ray or photon SDRT. So, um, you know, when I was involved in, in the proton studies, this is in the earlier days when there was no such thing as photon SDRT. That's a relatively newer uh, entity that, that's uh, been around uh, for the past five to 10 years. Uh, 
Um, so back then, proton therapy was a very uh, uh, a very effective treatment uh, for early stage lung cancer. Um, but now with uh, photon SBRT, we have a uh, a pretty good alternative actually. And so there's this question of okay, proton therapy is very effective, but we also have uh, photon SBRT. What's the difference? Is there an advantage of one or the other? And so this meta-analysis looked at uh, 72 photon SBRT studies, nine hypofractionated proton studies. And uh, what they found was that actually uh, proton patients had a, a, a bigger median uh, tumor size, 2.9 centimeters versus 2.4 centimeters. Um, and so what they found was Proton therapy had improved survival, uh, five year over well, survival, 60% versus 40%. Uh, improved progression free survival, 57% versus 37%. Um, and then improved three year local control uh, for proton, in favor of proton therapy. Uh, grade three to five toxicity were also found to be lower with proton therapy uh, at 4.8% versus 6.9% versus. Um, Photon SBRT. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. It's a meta analysis, so it's not a randomized control style, but it's still uh, it's still uh, important to make note of. So I hesitated to put this up because you really have to take a grain of salt with this. But MD Anderson did attempt to try to ran do a randomized trial between photon SBRT and proton SBPT uh, for high risk. Uh, early stage tumor. So high risk by high risk meaning centrally located or uh, large primary tumor greater than five centimeters. Uh, so these were medically inoperable patients, non small cell lung cancer, and they were treated with 50 gray and four fractions. Um, we take this with a grain of salt because only 21 patients were in the study, closed early due to poor accrual. And this is the challenge of proton therapy. I mean, that's just the reality. We, you know, it's not that there's a a lack of emphasis or a lack of desire to have proton uh, data is just really challenging sometimes to get patients to enroll in these studies. Um, and so only 21 patients were enrolled, but what they found uh, with the data that they had was they improved uh, overall survival in favor of proton therapy. Uh, uh, local control was equivalent, but there was a, an advantage in terms of three or So, you know, again, only 21 patients. You can't really make anything out of this, but we appreciate that MD Anderson at least attempted to do a uh, randomized study comparing proton SBRT and proton SBRT. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now switching gears to locally advanced non small cell lung cancer. Um, there's actually quite a bit more. Uh, momentum in trying to look at the role of proton therapy for stage three non small cell lung cancer. We talked about how with stage one, there's a pretty good alternative with photon SBRT. So, um, so that appears to be a lot of where that, uh, that's headed in terms of stage one lung cancer. But with stage three lung cancer, uh, there's quite a bit of interest in trying to decide what type of role a proton has in this setting. Um, so for in the early in early trials about 30 years ago, the um, the uh, standard dose for definitive radiation with chemotherapy for stage three lung cancer was set at 60 gray. Okay, um, and it's been like that for decades. However, more recent trials suggested that perhaps escalating the dose from 60 gray to 70 plus or 74 gray may improve outcomes. So this is why we, uh, this is where they came up with RTOG 0617. Now this is not a proton study. However, this is important because this is the dose escalation trial. They compared standard dose chemo and radiation versus uh, dose escalation chemo and radiation. So they compared standard 60 gray versus 74 gray. And you know, intuitively, you think that this, this was supposed to improve outcome. You get higher dose of radiation, you should have improved outcome. Well, it didn't really pan out. Uh, so what we find is that 
uh, survival was not any better with the high dose arm. In fact, it actually, there was a survival decrement uh, with the high dose arm. Um, as you would expect, there was a higher uh, toxicity profile with the high dose arm. So it's particularly with esophagitis, you had 21% esophagitis versus 7% 7, 7 esophagitis uh, for the standard dose arm. Uh, however, one thing that, that uh, uh, was, is important to note is that uh, on multivariate analysis, they found that heart dose was the main driver of overall survival in the high dose arm. So uh, in the discussion section of, of this paper, the authors are quoted as saying high dose, uh, heart dose might best explain why patients given 74 gray did worse than patients given the 60 gray. So the question is, did increased heart dose in the 74 gray arm lead to an increase in intercurrent cardiac deaths? And if you had a treatment modality that was able to simultaneously increase your dose, while protecting uh, the heart, would that um, affect the outcome? And so again, this is, I showed this slide from before, but if, uh, if, if you can, you know, with, with this type of treatment, if you increase this dose, then guess what? All of this increases too. Um, so including heart, contralateral lung. Uh, if you had proton therapy, you may increase this dose, but still spare the contralateral lung and spare most of uh, the heart in that setting. So that's a subject uh, of uh, investigation. And this is a study that's in currently enrolling right now, RTOG 1308, phase three randomized trial, looking at uh, specifically at uh, overall survival after getting photon versus proton chemo radiotherapy for inoperable phase two to three non small cell lung cancer. So they dose escalated to 70 gray with concurrent chemotherapy. Um, and, their, and their primary outcome is to look at overall survival and major cardiac events, uh, as well as uh, risk of myelosuppression. Um, secondary outcomes would be progression-free survival, grade three adverse events, quality of life, cost effectiveness, and uh, pulmonary function changes. Uh, so their target approval is 330 patients. Uh, so we await uh, this data, but this, uh, this is an important data. This is an important trial uh, trying to compare, uh, doing randomized uh, trials comparing proton therapy and proton therapy. <clears throat> okay, so uh, out of respect for Dr. Graham, we've got to also talk about surgery and trimodality therapy. Um, so, uh, This landmark paper in the group 0139 sort of established the role of trimodality therapy. In general, standard treatment is standard uh, dose radiation with chemotherapy. And this trial attempted to look at the role of radiotherapy with chemo uh, randomized to surgical resection or, or uh, definitive dose uh, uh, radiation therapy. And uh, so uh, they looked at 429 patients um, and randomized between definitive dose radiation to 61 gray with chemotherapy versus pre-op chemo radiation to 45 gray followed by surgery and uh, consolidated chemotherapy. Um, the surgery arm had uh, higher treatment related death. And interestingly, uh, patients who underwent new mammectomy had a 26% perioperative uh, mortality. So in terms of outcome, uh, they did have a uh, significantly improved five-year progression-free survival, 22% in the surgery arm versus 11%. However, this did not really translate into an overall survival benefit. Uh, median survival was equivalent. Five-year overall survival was starting to trend toward in favor of the surgery arm, but it never uh, reached statistical significance. So the question is, if trimodality therapy can be done more safely, would survival be improved? Um, I think there was another analysis done in this paper where they 
took out the pneumonectomy patients and, and focused only on the uh, lobectomy patients, but they found that the lobectomy patients did actually have a statistically significant overall survival event. And then this is just uh, taking it one step further. Uh, so this is trimodality therapy. Instead of a lower preoperative dose, they attempted to go to a definitive dose, uh, a standard definitive radiation dose to 60 gray. And uh, so they looked at 57 patients pathologically proved to be N2 or N3 disease. Um, and uh, they started with induction chemotherapy followed by concurrent chemo radiation to 61 gray, followed by surgical resection. And their main, uh, the primary outcome uh, was focused on uh, whether or not they could get, we could achieve a, a complete pathologic response um, following preoperative full dose chemo and radiation therapy. Um, so what they found, this is actually interesting. So two year overall survival was 54%. However, if you were able to achieve, if you were able to clear mediastinal nodal disease, you had a 75% two year overall survival. If you had residual disease, it was 52%. And then a few patients were not, ended up not being eligible for surgery. So they had a 23% two year overall survival. So this again raises the question, if we can dose escalate with radiation therapy um, with more definitive doses, and if we can clear the mediastinum, can we improve survival? And so th these are not proton trials per se. However, these are, I, I point these out as opportunities for potential proton trials that, that can look specifically at these issues. So in conclusion, proton beam radiation therapy has the advantage of limiting the dose of radiation beyond the range of the proton beam at depth. Um, uh, because it is a more conformal form of radiation treatment, uh, you might be able to improve therapeutic ratio by allowing dose escalation while still sparing critical normal tissues, such as heart, lungs, and great vessels. And of course, we need more dose escalation trials and randomized data comparing protons and proton uh, Um, ooh, I went a little over. I'm sorry. Uh, I will, if it's okay with you, I will end with a proton joke. Okay, can I end with a proton joke? Yeah, okay, yeah. so uh, a proton and a photon walk into a bar, okay, and they decide to order their first drinks. So the photon just keeps ordering more drinks and more drinks and more drinks. So the bartender goes to the proton and he said, Hey, don't you want to order more drinks so you can drink with your buddy? And the proton says, no, I'm good. Protons know when to stop. Thank you, Dr. Shin, for that. All right, next you have, we're gonna skip the raffle in, um, in Sigma, all sorts of in, in the interest of time. Um, the next, Person I'd like to introduce is Kim Hipple. Uh, she currently works at Thompson Oncology as a nurse practitioner. She received her master's in science of nursing at Carson Newman University. She holds board certifications in family practice and med medical oncology, working in oncology since 2008. She has served at CoPI in multiple locally based clinical trials. As her career began as a certified respiratory therapist, caring for lung cancer patients has been one of her main clinical interests. Please welcome Kimberly Pickle. Okay, so today we're going to talk about immunotherapy and lung cancer and toxicity management. This is my only disclosure. And the objectives is to review immune related toxicities in different immunotherapy, review assessment and treatment for immune related toxicities. So, when I'm trying to do my talk, I was looking at all of the current immunotherapies used in the setting of lung cancer. Um, and you can see there's currently six. Um, and so, it was interesting to note that these were all the most common um, side effects listed. But if you notice, you know, some of these include the suffix itis, so inflammatory. 
uh, conditions. It's very common in toxicity with immunotherapy. So when I'm starting a person on immunotherapy, I essentially kind of do a body system check. I will say, well, these things can kind of happen. You can have thyroiditis, pneumonitis, hepatitis, colitis, and, um, and kidney <coughs> issues, or nephritis. So they kind of remember that as a body system. But what was kind of interesting to note that the two first immunotherapies that were on the market was the nivolumab and the ipilimumab, which tends to have more additives listed than the other. And with the state of the science, it's gotten so progressive that actually the third listed was not even in a text that I was referring to. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So immune-related toxicity by system, again, pulmonary, the instance is three to 10%. Um, and the way we assess that in patients is any reporting any new or worsening cough, shortness of breath or chest pain. Um, for renal toxicity, you can have an immune induced nephritis with renal dysfunction, but you would see that an increase in their creatinine. Uh, gastrointestinal, very common is colitis. So when we first started treating uh, melanoma with double it, your um, ipilimumab and nivolumab, we would say make sure that you don't treat diarrhea just as diarrhea. Make sure that you just don't think that this is just a common belly bug. Make sure you tell your PCP or your emergency physician that you're on these drugs because you have to be treated differently than the average patient walking into the door. Um, endocrine therapy, uh, I'm sorry, endocrine immune toxicities can occur in the thyroid, causing thyroiditis. But it's interesting enough when you're following along with the patient, this can actually cause a induced hyperthyroidism, which we will see a low TSH. And essentially, we'll kind of wait out for that thyroid to burn out and turn into a hypothyroid condition. And then our threshold to starting um, thyroid replacement therapy is around the TSA to 10. Uh, Pituitary um, immunotherapy, adrenal, and you can have some low cortisol levels with that. This is commonly used with hypocortisone orally, um, pancreatic insufficiency. Um, and so the endocrine, I think I left a number out there, that's five to 10% instance with endocrine uh, immunotherapy toxicities. Interesting also listed is type 1 diabetes mellitus, and I'm assuming that's coming from the pancreatic inflammation. Um, hepatic is also very, very common, and they will split this out as one to 10% in monotherapy. So if you just use one immunotherapy agent, but if you use a doublet, then in a combination that increases to 25 to 32%. And that can actually cause autoimmune hepatitis, not an infectious hepatitis, which I also bring forward to the patient that this is not an infectious hepatitis, but something that's brought about by the drug that is fixable. Again, you can go have some dermatologic toxicities, and these are actually the most common. These are most interesting. So you can't always just assume the patient got into their poison ivy packs when they got into the yard. Um, you can have a macular papilla rash, which can happen anywhere. Um, they can have a simple itching. So when I first started treating people with the, in the setting of melanoma, um, they would just have itching. And so sometimes I can actually keep them on therapy if you start like an oral antihistamine, just to kind of keep them on drug. And what's also interesting to note, um, most recently I've seen some non-malignant lesion in immunotoxicity, toxicity, one called erythema nodosum, and I see this in a nivolumab patient. Uh, erythema nodosum is a paniculitis type condition where you can have painful swelling of the legs and actually have nodules in the subcutaneous space, uh, and that can be simply treated with um, ibuprofen. Lichen planus is one that I saw most recently, and it's interesting to note that lichen planus looks a lot like psoriasis. So if you have somebody with an instant case of psoriasis, most likely it's lichen planus. And interestingly, the two patients that I did have with lichen planus um, responded very beautifully to this topical curve steroids by um, the dermatologist. So. Um, it is reversible. Uh, cardiac toxicities, those are the ones that we have to really worry about. Myocarditis, um, they can induce arrhythmias or actually cause chest pain. So chest pain can be minimized or myocarditis. Neurology can have some encephalitis, neuropathy or weakness. Most of this is from malaise and fatigue most commonly. Um, rheumatologic condition, when I've been treating patients with rheumatologic conditions such as RA, sometimes they can't have a flare of pain from that. Um, and what's interesting to note that when you do treat that flyer, their pain gets better. <laughs> um, ophthalmologic, we actually have one patient right now that we have seen changes in their extraocular muscles. And we're thinking that's probably brought about by their immunotherapy and the um, ophthalmologist is actually treating that with the same thing. We treat all these ISCs, essentially it's prednisone, one milligram per kilogram per day. And it is um, weaned over, over a four to six week period. 
Um, and when you're first starting out as a new nurse practitioner or a new provider, you're like, well, there's a prednisone with ASL. But it's very well tolerated. You get them on, you get them off very quickly, specifically very well tolerated. So treatment of patients with pre-existing rheumatic diseases, these patients are actually excluded in immunotherapy trials, which is interesting, but these people do have cancer that we have to treat. Um, up to 44% of patients with immune-mediated immune inflammatory diseases treat immunotherapy will experience disease flares, just as I stated. And again, just treated with simple assistant steroids. 27 to 29% of patients may develop early onset immunotherapy toxicities after initiation of therapy. So you may actually see these rheumatologic patients actually developing a little bit more early toxicities than the average patient. Treatment of patients with pre-existing HIV, the literature says it's generally well tolerated, that we shouldn't be afraid to use it in this population. The HIV can remain suppressed, so they won't come out of a remissive state with their viral loads. And then there's phase one and phase two clinical trials ongoing in this particular population. Immunity-related toxicities can occur months after treatment, after initiation, even after treatment discontinuation. So what's interesting though, with this class of drug, you can actually have benefit, even though we have to stop the drug, either they terminated their um, clinical benefit, um, or for some, time, for some reason, we've had to interrupt therapy due to um, toxicity. There is a more defined time window for some um, adverse events than others, and the onset is generally early in patients who receive combination therapy. So if you're having to use a doublet, excuse me, oh, tissue papers. All right, we're going to take a little break really fast and we're going to do a raffle. All right, so if you have the ticket number, you guys all have your tickets in hand. Uh, 283341. All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to do one more raffle. All right, you guys still have your tickets handy? All right, the number is 283351. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Two, eight, three, three, five, one. Let's you. All right, Dr. Grover over here. All right, we're going to do our last raffle. All right, this one is two, eight, three, 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 four. All right, is that you? All right, Ashley. All right, we're going to go to our next presenter, Dr. Chester Ramsey. He's the Chief Medical Physicist at Covenant Health and an adjunct professor with the Nuclear Engineer Department at University of Tennessee. He is board certified by the American Board of Radiology and the American Board of Medical Physics. 
Dr. Ramsey and his collaborators have pioneered the clinical develop, develop of new radiation therapy technology, such as inten, intensity modulated radiation therapy, image guided radiation therapy, and respiratory gated radiation therapy. He has published over 150 peer reviewed manuscripts and scientific abstracts. All right, thank you. No, I'll be good, I'll be good. All right, thank you. So I'm going to talk about something that's a little different from the previous presentations. I'm gonna talk about the applications of big data and how we can potentially use that in cancer treatment and how that, and how that rolls in to the clinical trial process. So I'm gonna specifically talk about the prediction of lung tumor response during radiation therapy. So the type of cancer in this particular study is stage three lung cancer that is treated with radiation therapy. And with radiation therapy, we typically treat in somewhere between 25 and 30 fractions of radiation therapy. The fractions are given a day a week, Monday through, through um, Friday. The patients that are treated with radiation therapy are often CT image immediately before each of the treatment sessions. We call this image guided radiation therapy. And the purpose of these images is to help position the patient. So in this animation here in the lower right hand corner, we have two CT images that are shown. The grayscale portion of the image is the treatment planning CT image. This is a CT scan that we took of the patient and represents the desired position of the patient, where we would like the patient to be while they're treated. The blue scale image is a CT image that was taken of the patient on the treatment table immediately before the patient was treated. The purpose of this image is to compare it to the desired position and get the patient in the correct location so that all the beams of radiation are focused where we want them to be. And with these two types of imaging, we can position the patient with submillimeter accuracy. Although these images are used to position the patient, there's a wealth of information in these images that are acquired every day that we can use for other purposes. In this image here, this is a time-lapse movie loop over the course of 38 days of treatment for this lung cancer patient. This patient has two tumors. There's one here and one here. And you can see over the course of this 38 day course of treatment, the tumors are shrinking in size. And we can use this information to achieve other goals other than just setting the patient up and making sure that they're in the right position. So here at the Thompson Cancer Survival Center, we instigated an investigator initiated clinical trial where I was the PI on this particular, particular trial. And the goal was to measure tumor response and see if we could predict what was going to happen in the future. So how can we use this information and what does the, the raw data look like? To begin with, patients that are normally treated with radiation therapy have these images that are taken before each of the treatment sessions. So this is supposed to represent a Monday through Friday calendar in each of these squares represents a CT image that was taken of a patient immediately before they were treated. So retrospectively, we can go back and look at what this tumor did over the course of treatment. So in this case, we have 50 elapsed days of treatment and the y-axis is the tumor size. And we can see that this tumor is shrinking over the course of, of treatment. And we can analyze this retrospectively. So we're not really making any clinical decisions at this point in time with the data. We're just retrospectively going back and seeing what happened. However, you can use this information if you're able to, to um, analyze the data to make some changes, some course corrections in the, the patient's treatment. So, here we have, as an example, a patient that's treated for four treatment sessions. Each of these sessions has a CT image that's taken. 
we can take the tumor response in these four sessions and adapt to the treatment plan. So in an adapted treatment plan, we're taking into consideration that that tumor has changed in size, shape, and position, and our dose distributions may not be optimal for that patient anymore because of those tumor uh, changes. And the shrinkage is a good thing. We, we want that, but we want to keep giving the best radiation dose possible. So we take these initial images, adapt to the plan, and continue on with the patient's treatment. After two weeks, we repeat that process. We look at the shrinkage, make a second adaptation to the plan, and continue on. This is called offline adaptive therapy, where we're, we're proactively looking at changes in anatomy, making a change to the plan, continuing on and doing these adaptations at a predefined interval. So in this case, every, every one or two weeks. However, ideally, we would like them to predict ahead of time when will be the optimal times to optimize those treatment plans. So here, and this is the subject of, of this study, we have five observations of the patient. We've measured the tumor volume over those five fractions. In this particular case, the treatment, uh, the tumor volume is in, actually increasing in size. And we developed a model, which I'll explain in a few moments, that predicts with uncertainty out in the future what that tumor is going to do. And this allows us to calculate and predict which are the optimal days that give us the best benefit to change and adapt that plan to give the best dose distributions to the patient. So how do we go about doing this? So we started with a database of 563 CT images that we had in a database of patients that had previously been treated. Um, these patients were treated with radiation therapy and the tumor volume was manually contoured or outlined in each of the CT datasets. We then used what is called as a locally weighted regression model to, to perform these predictions. So this is a non-linear, non-parametric model that uses a, a set of of data of prior observations to make future predictions. So let's work our way through how this, how this uh, will work. So we have a new patient, and this new patient in this example has had four CT images. They've been treated for four radiation therapy fractions, and we know what the tumor looks like in these, in these four sessions. We have a trained data set that's called a memory vector that contains um, the, the, the historical observations of prior patients. So this is our, 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 our database of prior observations. And we look at fractions one through four in this memory vector to match the fractions one through four that we see in our new patient. <clears throat> we use a Euclidean distance operator to compare these observations in the new patient to those in the the memory vector, again, for these first four fractions. <clears throat> we use a Gaussian kernel function to look at similarity between the memory vector images and those in our new observation. And we have this value H squared, which is called bandwidth, which helps, which helps um, uh, fit the data in the optimization. Next, we have memory vectors. Again, it's the same data set as, the, as the, the initial one through four fractions, but this contains data for fractions five through, through 35, so the future observations. So this is applied to a weighted sum of squared errors optimization that is minimized to determine the predictive output of the, the optimization. So the result is the predicted tumor volumes and the associated uncertainty. So now that we've talked about the, uh, the math, um, let's get into how this actually, actually worked. So we use what's called a leave one out cross validation. So all that means is we've got our data set of historical observations. We're going to leave one patient out and that's going to be our test subject in this mathematical model. And then we're going to use the model to predict what happens to that, uh, that tumor. <clears throat> so here is an example of one of the, uh, the patients. 
So here in this example, we had uh, three imaging sessions that were performed, and we have the, the predicted tumor size into the, the future and calculated positions in green that would be the optimal places to adapt the plan for this patient. We also calculate a residual tumor volume probability map. So this is the, in the CT image where the residual tumor mass that's left is most likely to be. So that may be the, the most, the most um, uh, radio resistant portion of the, the tumor. As more CT image sets are added, our prediction is refined. I like to compare this to something that you all have seen. It's, it's hurricane season, and you've seen the hurricane prediction maps that have the cone of uncertainty of where the, the hurricane is going, and the hurricane position gets updated on the, the map, and the prediction may change in one way or another where the hurricane is going. Same sort of concept with this predictive map. As more data is added, the calculation is refined, and the, the positions of the final tumor response change and the uncertainties change. As more data points are added, the uncertainties decrease as to what the final tumor mass is going to be for the, the patient. So how did this work for our patients in this particular study? So the x-axis here is each of the lesions, so each of the tumors that were evaluated. The bar graphs represent the tumor volume. This tall bar graph in the, in the, uh, the first slot that is this blue color, that's the initial tumor volume on fraction one. The, um, <clears throat> the second bar graph that's a, um, uh, 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 whatever that color is. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm, a, I'm a guy, I, I don't do colors fairly well. So whatever that middle color is, the, um, that is the actual final tumor predicted, the, the final tumor size. The magenta color on the, the right, that's what the algorithm predicted along with its uncertainty. And so all of these in, in lesions one through 11, the, the predicted final tumor volume was within the uncertainty that was calculated by the algorithm, except for this one patient here, number nine, and the, the calculated volume was only off by, by 0.6 cc. So even though it was outside the air bars, it was very close. So this is lesions 12 through 19. Again, some of these tumors had, had very large responses, but take patient 17 for, for example, the tumor volume started off at close to 30 cc's in volume, and at the end of treatment, the predicted tumor volume was, was two and a half cc's, and that was predicted during the first week of treatment, by the way, and the actual uh, tumor volume at the end of treatment um, was within 0.8 cc's of the, uh, the, the predicted value. Uh, this is lesions 20 and 21. We're progress progressing to a to larger tumor volume. So these are smaller numbers of patients in the data set. Here, both of these, the final volume and the predicted volume, were, uh, were very similar to one another and certainly within the error bars of the calculation. This is perhaps the, uh, the most interesting one, is patients number 22 and 23, which were very large E3 tumors that were between seven and 800 cc's in size at the beginning of treatment and dropped down to about 250 cc's in size at the end of treatment. So even though the database did not contain patients with large tumors like these two patients, the model was still able to predict accurately their tumor response. So in summary, we have developed a novel technique for predicting tumor response over the course of therapy from a limited number of observations at the beginning of the course of therapy. And so this can be used to predict optimal times to, to adapt the treatment plans. And this can also give us some information about the, about the, patient's, the patient's course of treatment. We want to see tumor response. So if our predictive model tells us that we're predicting that the tumor is going to shrink in size by 80%, then, then our treatment regimen is, is going in the correct direction. 
if our model tells us that the predicted change in tumor size is 20% over the, the course of therapy. Well, this is during the first week of treatment that we've identified this response. So it gives us the opportunity to maybe change course in our direction and further customize the treatment for that individual patient. <clears throat> and I thank you for your time and attention. I think if the tumor, you know, the issue is showing all the tumor, and would we assume that the tumor, you know, backwards on this, but the heaviest dose is going to the center of the tumor, which is kind of the get the water to soak into the center of the tumor, right? It's yeah. that, that's where the most the, 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 mm -hmm. that's correct. So the idea of coning in on this and kind of adjusting the pattern. As you go, it makes sense with that. But you know, that's a failure pattern. I mean, I'm curious if you thought you could do this with PET scans instead of CT scans. Let's actually die in first in the tumor. And that's, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking is this really the, the best way to adjust the plan? Well, one reason we have we have to adjust the plans. Uh, not because of, of where the residual tumor is going to be, but we have to adapt the plans because then the, the dose shape that we've planned doesn't end up being what's delivered if the tumor shrunk in size by, by 50%. So irregardless of where the residual tumor is going to be, we have to replan it anyway to make the dose distributions be the correct shape after all of these anatomical changes. And uh, to, your, to your point on the the location of where the, the residual disease is at um, and dosed throughout the target volume uh, in radiation in, in, in conventional radiation therapy, which is what I'm talking about, we try and make the dose distribution as uniform as possible throughout the target volume using using standard radiation therapy. But perhaps perhaps we shouldn't do that. Perhaps we should give a integrated boost to this area of predicted location of where the residual disease is going to be, since we know that that's the could be the, the most likely site of recurrence. Right, especially as you start to raise more of the right? I think that's, that's it for consideration. Yes. Were you able to identify any variables between the people who responded well and those that did not, such as the type of chemo that was given with them, the uh, Cell types. I mean, is there any other variable? We we did we did track all that. I did not include the slide that gave all the all these statistics on each of the patients, what chemotherapy they had. Problem is here in this particular study is it was only 23 patients. So there's not enough patients to get any statistical significance of, of patients that had this particular characteristic did better than the others. But it's a proof of concept. It's a proof, it, yeah. The purpose of this wasn't so much what patients are responding better or are going to have greater survival is it was, can this model predict what future behavior is going to be? Now, in our, have you found, presumably you're working on a way to incorporate that into our practical treatment of patients throughout the system. Are we using this model? At, at present, this model is not being used clinically. Is it, It's simply for in this case, for as you said, proof of principle of the concept. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, we are bringing back Kim Pickle to finish up. So onset toxicity for immunotherapy is most common between the first and second doses can be colitis on week four to week four to ten. Dermatitis on week four to six, thyroiditis, topoclusitis, week six to even greater than 30. Um, so it's interesting to note that these endocrine um, itises can happen later on in the course of treatment. Less common, two or more doses. Um, you can have pneumonitis between week 10 and 15, hepatitis week six to 14. Weakness, fatigue, neuropathy tends to be kind of ongoing throughout. Um, nephritis can be as late as week 20 to 30 at peak. And in particular, we had one patient that actually developed nephritis acutely 
after like 11th cycle of Pembro. Um, and it was, we put her on the one milligram per kilogram per day, and she only essentially lost one cycle in the timing of treatment. So she responded to it extremely well. Neurologic, ophthalmologic, and cardiac all tend to be less common. It was also interesting, you know, the comparison of the consensus guidelines between ASCO and the Society of Anal Therapy in Cancer, um, that with ASCO with grade one toxicity, you can have close monitoring on both. In grade two, ASCO recommended stop until grade zero to one and consider steroid. And then with the SIPC was to stop and consider steroid and to restart to resolve or control with less than 10 milligrams per prednisone equivalent per day. Um, grade three and four, Society of Immunotherapy and Cancer had no general recommendations, but however, we tend to mostly follow the ASCO guidelines. With grade three, we do stop, start the height of steroid, which is the prednisone, uh, taper over the four to six week period, and may require a flexible number of other therapies that we tend to use typically more in the colitis setting. And with grade four, you currently discontinue. So patient management is close follow-up. Um, because these um, are given every three, to, sometimes even six weeks, uh, we really wanted to see them in a pretty close interval, especially at the get-go. Um, and we can do close follow just by lab monitoring. And so that's usually built into your regimen. So you're going to do CBC, CMP, TSA, 3T4, cortisol, uh, with uh, essentially each cycle, if not every other cycle. Continuous assessment is what we do every day, taking care of patients like we're supposed to do, history and physical and labs, degree of fatigue, new cough, you know, chest pain, bowel habits and poor quality. Um, I also tell people, especially with the colitis and especially in the doublet setting, that if you have just a little bit of diarrhea and all of a sudden that little diarrhea turns into a lot of diarrhea, then I don't even know about that because that's simply just not simple diarrhea. It could be an immune dish response. Um, new rashes, again, just don't assume that it's poison ivy in the backyard and new body pain. Early intervention is the best you know, prevention to kind of cure observation for grade zero to one. It can be a topical steroid. It can be as pledged as a synth steroid or actually referral. So referral to GI service or um, the infleximab therapy or the dermatic moderate or any type of atypical skin lesion that you're concerned with. Patient education from the get-go. Just make sure you let them know that sometimes common things are not always so common in this setting. Healthcare team awareness, talk to your PCP, talk to your um, ED physicians and your healthcare team members and let them know that you're on this particular type of treatment and you may have special needs. Wallet cards was something that was first started when the um, immunotherapies first came out. Um, you know, these little people had all their med lists written down in their little handwriting. So just like that, we can also have a wallet card pre-made that is, shows what drugs they're on um, and to uh, notify us if they have any questions. And symptom checklists also came out when we first came out. Um, and that also helped not even the healthcare provider, but also the patient, you know, to check this, go through it and see if there's anything new or different. So associated pain, immunotherapy toxicities and outcomes, you know, you worry about, well, it's immunotherapy, so you really don't want to suppress immune systems, so you're putting on steroids, so wouldn't that suppress the treatment? But patients can develop toxicity that parents uh, experience both the overall survival benefit and progression-free progression survival benefit for immunotherapy compared to patients who did not develop toxicity, particularly even in endocrine dermatologic and low-grade and adverse events. Another large analysis that reported overall survival and progression-free survival benefit in patients with developing toxicity following immunotherapy. So again, cortical steroids have a wide-ranging inflammatory and other effects. The studies have shown similar clinical outcomes in patients who require immunosuppression to treat toxicity than those who did not require treatment. However, again, because it is um, corticosteroid inhibit at least some effects of effective antitumor responses, but again, it's a risk benefit. Rheumatologic toxicities often require high dose corticosteroids and they may require synthetic or biologic DMR therapy. So essentially, the general question, the crux of the talk is the appropriate steroid dose for our toxicities. It's not the medical dose pack. It's not the hydrocortisone because that's what you use for the cortisol suppression. It's not the dexamethasone. It's the prednisone one milligram per kilogram per day uh, weighed over a four to six week period. Thank you. Well, I'm looking at the guidelines, existing guidelines. They do have this little comment in there about steroids and continuing treatment through steroids. And when this first came out, oh, so God, no, don't treat them when they're on steroids, that will work. Now we know that's not true. But um, so the guideline there is 10 milligrams, right? 10 milligrams per kilogram. One milligram per kilogram per day. No, 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 we can assume treatment. Yes, it can. You can't keep them on treatment at 10 milligrams or less. Right, but that's just a guideline. <laughs> that's not, we all know what guidelines actually mean. 
I'll say the best in part of the room. But it, you haven't seen that movie, Bush. But um, it's, it, it's, what's magic about the pen? That was just part of the recommendations, but essentially, you know, we try to keep people on, take them, put them on and take them off as quickly as possible. Right. But it is, a, it is possible to treat somebody with a continual low dose there were just to right. get them on I've had people, so we keep them on treatment, we keep them on five milligrams of prednisone or up to 10 milligrams just to get them through treatment. If we go off, they crash, put them back on, you can get them through treatment. And have done that, it's worked well. One other question for very early colitis, have you ever tried to invest in mine? Yes, I, thank you for bringing that up. So with um, diarrhea, you can just do lamotrigine, uh, just the over-the-counter stuff. You can escalate that to a modal, um, and then we also you can use colcyrene um, or bedesinide. Uh, so you know, typically you hear about these are respiratory therapists something bedesinide, something you inhale, but it's actually oral uh, and it's very very effective. Yes. It's something that we can try before escalating to right. Right. Yes. You can treat through. You can do that you can treat that without a problem. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your Talk. Um, I want to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Wade Ein. He is a translational researcher specializing in thoracic malignancy. Dr. Ein treats patients with thoracic malignancies, and his research focuses on discovering and validating novel blood biomarkers that can be used to better monitor lung cancer patients and identifying genetic factors that may play a role in development of lung cancer. Dr. Imes is also helps conduct clinical research, clinical trials at Vanderbilt for patients with thoracic malignancies, phase one trials, and with a special focus on new immuno-oncology strategies in patients with solid tumors. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, We'll skip ahead rapidly here. I know David from his time at Vanderbilt, great to see you. Thank you for having me. This is a beautiful facility and a really cool evening. Uh, and then Brian, actually, I was born and raised in South Bend. Uh, so I know that, that that culture very well. And a big Notre Dame fan. So we have a kind of big game, not as big as your game this weekend. It's Clemson uh, coming to Notre Dame. But good luck at Georgia. You beat Alabama. That's the most important thing. Uh, and uh, when I was in college, it was the Phil Fulmer era. It was you know, towards the end of that, supposed to be times for Tennessee for sure. Hopefully, you're back there. Um, so um, tonight, I'm going to talk about the potential for circulating tumor DNA to guide treatment in patients with lung cancer. So when David brought up that as the potential talk uh, topic, I just this is my uh, passion in uh, all the clinical trials, and I think we're just uh, scratching the surface with what we do with liquid biopsy technology in the clinic, and so. I'll tell you stories about how that's going uh, and trying to get this into prospective trials uh, this evening. And I'll start with a little bit of background as well. The key component of my disclosures is that most of the conversations I have with the drug companies in the context of using liquid biopsies is actually, you know, first I have to say your drugs are really great. They really help a lot of patients, but I think liquid biopsies may be able to tell us which patients may not need them. Uh, so I'll tell you about some specific examples of uh, uh, trials along those lines. Um, there's two big distinctions within the concepts I'll talk about this evening. Uh, the first is clinical utility versus clinical validity. Um, so uh, that's the big dis distinction that I would have you take away from this evening's talk. Clinically valid measurements uh, signify that what we think we're measuring, we are measuring. So circulating tumor DNA, we're measuring tumor-associated DNA mutations in the bloodstream. And I would say that early stage lung cancer assay we heard about earlier, that's clinically valid. Uh, we know that it's measuring risk for recurrence in patients with lung cancer who have resection. Clinical utility is the much higher bar to cover. And there you have to prove that doing a novel measurement uh, in the bloodstream or from a tumor uh, can be used to change treatment and improve patient outcomes. So where do we have clinical utility? Uh, in making these liquid biopsy measurements to make treatment decisions 
that we have evidence improves patient outcomes versus where's the potential for that clinical utility. And the best way to distinguish that, and I'll show you some heavier data sets to come, uh, is that when we do these liquid biopsies to test, say, for an EGFR mutation in a patient with stage four non-small cell lung cancer, we have good evidence that there's clinical utility that's starting to grow so for that patient. It's going to work and it's going to be beneficial. What we don't know is, say, in a surgically resected patient or a patient with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, if we do a liquid biopsy after their definitive treatment, when they might be cured, how does that inform treatment? We, have, we don't know whether it would be valid to still treat that patient based on that liquid biopsy result. And that's essentially the minimal residual disease field. In non-small cell lung cancer, we're a little bit behind colon cancer, which has really led the field of oncology to try to use these liquid biopsy assays to determine which patients need further treatment versus not. The pre-question, and I implied it uh, earlier in, in the uh, content so far, is that um, just thinking about what are the biggest data sets we may have in patients with lung cancer uh, to inform uh, the use of these molecules. So we can just uh, think to ourselves, I don't need uh, uh, audience calls, but if you want to call it, that's fine. Uh, research among patients with non-small cell lung cancer with what specific mutation do you think has provided the most evidence uh, uh, to suggest uh, this big camera? Uh, to suggest kind of utility. So you think about that, those are the data sets that I'll show you to follow. So in, in summary this evening, I'll go through what is circulating tumor DNA. I'm using that so far interchangeably with liquid biopsy, a more common term uh, for assessing these circulating DNA mutations uh, in patients, uh, why they matter, and then I'll talk about when we typically assess them in clinic now and when we might do that in the future. And I'll end with some specific examples of projects we've done at Vanderbilt dedicated to patients with small cell lung cancer, hopefully give you some ideas and then potential for collaboration with patient specimens with these data sets together. So first, what is circulating tumor DNA? So small fragments of DNA are shed by all of our cells at all times, including tumor cells. They're generally about 150 base pair fragments. And the more rigorous scientific term is actually cell-free DNA. Uh, so just DNA molecules floating in the bloodstream independent of the cell. Uh, and the way that we know that these are tumor DNA based on liquid biopsies is actually big data. So we've sequenced so many tumors at this point in the field of oncology, we know what are typical cancer-associated mutations. And when we see them in DNA circulating in the blood, we say, well, that's a cancer mutation. Um, there's two potential pitfalls uh, in what we have to filter for all the liquid biopsy assays. And I won't get into many more specifics, but the two ways you could go wrong if you say, see, an EGFR mutation, you have to first make sure it's actually not an inherited mutation. Um, there actually have been scenarios of EGFR T790M that's inherited uh, and think BRCA mutations and other mutations that can be inherited uh, rather than from the tumor. And the other phenomenon that we've learned a lot about recently is that blood cells over time can actually acquire cancer mutations like in TP53 uh, or other uh, mutations that are associated with cancer but it's actually not cancer. It's this phenomenon called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. Uh, and the way you pick that out in the blood is actually the variant allele frequency is usually around five to 10%, and then it doesn't change with treatments, tends to be totally disconjugated uh, to the other tumor associated mutations. So there's a lot of sophisticated ways that that's being filtered out in the results that we see. But these uh, cell-free and specifically circulating tumor DNA molecules uh, have uh, exist very short uh, time frames in the blood, just about 90 minutes. And they're actually less than 1% of the total circulating cell-free DNA because all of our cells are shedding this at all times just through the normal growth and dying process of our cells. So uh, that's at its root what circulating tumor DNA is and what I'm going to talk about applications of throughout. So why do liquid biopsies matter uh, in the clinic? I think we're all familiar, particularly in the context of stage four non-small cell lung cancer, uh, of patients coming in with a new diagnosis and we see their biopsy result and we don't have sufficient tissue to test for mutations to see what they're eligible for, for potential targeted therapies or oral therapies. 
Um, it's a couple of facts about uh, biopsies, particularly in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. The likelihood that they'll be not sufficient for molecular testing is variable by site. Uh, and some studies have cited as low as 18%. I think in my experience, it's higher. This was a liquid biopsy study. So I think that we're doing a little better than 18% rate of tumor-based uh, molecular testing for our patients, uh, but it can be low. And those are scenarios where we really need liquid biopsies to see if patients are eligible for oral therapies. And these next couple of slides are, I think, just uh, general, nice to look at uh, in terms of population effects of these molecular targeted therapies uh, in patients with lung cancer. So when we think about the advanced lung cancer treatment landscape, uh, really over the last uh, close to uh, 80 years, uh, targeted therapies or uh, oral therapies directed at specific oncogenic mutations like EGFR, ALK, and the more uncommon ones like ROS1, REPT, I think we have eight or nine NCCN guideline approved first line therapies for patients with stage four non-small cell lung cancer have, who have these mutations has really been a breakthrough for treatment options. But has this made a difference on the population level? Uh, and that's what I think is the most fascinating data to look at. So this is actually data put together by the National Cancer Statistics um, and the years reflected are still um, not fully up to date. This is 2014 to 2018, uh, and it's broken down by gender. Uh, and we see that the two cancer histologies with the most significant improvement uh, in overall survival are melanoma and lung cancer. Melanoma and lung cancer share the two big breakthroughs in cancer therapy, immunotherapy and oncogene-directed therapies. So these have made huge differences in survival on the population level. Another way to display the data and also gets in a critical point about how early stage cancer and catching it early and treating it is always going to be the best approach is this figure. So it's a little bit complicated, but I'll walk you through it. So similar, it's a little bit older statistics uh, going from 2001 to 2014. And here we're looking at lung cancer mortality by stage at diagnosis. Um, so this is uh, age-adjusted survival. Uh, and so uh, most patients caught at a very early stage remain alive at two years. So to me, this suggests early detection, making sure we're staying up to date on lung cancer screening. That's always going to be the best strategy to treat um, patients with lung cancer. But the reality is we're always going to see patients who are diagnosed at the time of stage four <laughs> And starting in 2009, 2010, which was really the introduction of EGFR inhibitors into the clinic for patients with non-small cell lung cancer, the curve just totally changes shape. Um, so this is really amazing to see. And this is why we're doing liquid biopsies in the clinic today, uh, because we want to continue these improvements uh, for patients by identifying treatments uh, for these oncogenic mutations as they continue to become available. But now let's dive in more into that clinical validity and clinical utility distinction. And I think it'll make more sense when I put some examples around the data sets that I'm alluding to. So currently when in the clinic I send a liquid biopsy, I'm more in the um, solid tumor simultaneous with tumor NGS. Um, so there's really two scenarios and they're, you know, they're highly debated as far as uh, what we should do in practice when we're seeing patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, some folks would prefer to just reflex to the liquid biopsy if the tissue is insufficient. We do know that liquid biopsies can miss about 10% uh, of mutations that would be seen directly from the tumor. So sensitivity or the ability to catch every mutation is best still from the tumor. Um, so there is a case to be made to just send liquid biopsy if the tumor is insufficient. But the clinical reality that we all face is that uh, getting the tumor molecular testing done can be difficult and can be a battle at times with significant delays. So the way I approach clinic currently uh, is that I typically send a liquid biopsy when I'm meeting a patient while we have that tumor next generation sequencing going uh, because you never know what delays we're going to run into down the line. Uh, and that can be very difficult to navigate, especially in patients with higher odds of having targetable oncogenic mutations. Um, so there's a couple of different times you can send, uh, but then it relates to clinical utility. And it's usually just at first diagnosis 
or at the time of resistance to a targeted therapy that I'm sending. I'm generally not sending these uh, repeatedly or longitudinally uh, or at the end of definitive treatment when we think a patient might be cured. Uh, but those are some uh, research settings on the horizon that I hope we can start doing someday. So I'm really harping on this distinction between clinical validity and clinical utility. Uh, and here's it spelled out a little more in depth. Uh, so again, clinical validity is the extent that the measurement we think we're measuring is accurate. In this case, are we truly measuring a mutation that's present in the tumor uh, itself? Uh, and for the most part with these big databases, as long as we can accurately filter out what may be germline or inherited, and what may be just picked up with age and not actually in that lung cancer tumor, um, they are accurate and valid. But is there clinical utility? Does that measurement and application of that measurement or treatment to that measurement improve clinical outcomes in terms of improving efficacy and survival for patients, uh, which is the most important thing, and reducing toxicity? Um, so could we avoid immunotherapy and we have more and more patients getting it in the adjuvant setting, and, and I'm always asking, gosh, I don't know that all these patients need this, but I don't have any way to select which patients don't need this treatment. Um, and we're putting everyone at risk when we're treating all these patients. Um, but that proof of clinical utility is the big cliff to get to. And sometimes I liken the, the gap of getting from clinical validity to clinical utility can be huge. Uh, and really that's the focus of a lot of uh, uh, what I consider the novel work that I'm doing and really trying to get this message out there as much as possible. So what do we know about the clinical utility of treating that liquid biopsy result in patients with non-small cell lung cancer? Or in other words, has it been definitively shown that deciding on a treatment based on a liquid biopsy result can be as good as based on a tumor biopsy result? So the biggest and best data set that's been put together was from the Flora study, which was the first line to Grisso study in patients with EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, and this is just the progression-free survival curve with patients treated with Tegriso versus erlotinib or gefitinib, the standard EGFR TKIs at the time. And we see that osimertinib significantly improved median progression-free survival. So this was actually the tumor uh, molecular testing or MGS result that was used here. They, they did collect blood at the time of diagnosis and broke down the data set in a different publication uh, in similar fashion. Uh, and what was observed was exactly what we'd hoped. So using plasma circulating tumor DNA or liquid biopsy, EGFR mutations, we saw this same pattern. Uh, Tegriso use significantly improved progression-free survival uh, compared to erlotinib or gefitinib. And these were big patient numbers, so nearly 200 patients in each group. Uh, we have yet to see this big of data sets proving that use of liquid biopsy. We just really extrapolate from this and say, okay, based on that EGFR data, if it's an ALK or a ROS1 mutation or uh, a MET mutation that we can treat uh, with our targeted agents because we've seen uh, that in big data sets, the use of liquid biopsy has similar results to tumor. But one little call out and implication from the data that's pretty interesting, if we look at the median progression-free survival when it was tumor next generation sequencing, for Tegriso, it's about 19 months compared to 10 months. Well, when we did the liquid biopsy data, it was 15 months compared to a little less than 10 months. So both groups match down a little bit. And that's because we do know that the detection of circulating tumor DNA is a negative prognostic finding. It is also associated with tumor burden. So the more tumor burden the patient has, the more likely you are to catch that in your liquid biopsy. Uh, and so it makes sense that your outcomes have, would have the same pattern, but would be notched down a little bit just with the liquid biopsy result. Um, so that's the utility at the time of diagnosis. Um, there were some really good data sets uh, put together in the erlotinib era at the time of resistance. Um, and so that's where alluding to the use of liquid biopsy at the time of resistance uh, to oncogene-directed therapies comes in. Uh, so again, this is tumor-based uh, T790M acquisition. So when erlotinib was the most common first-line EGFR inhibitor in use, T790M uh, acquired resistance was far and away the most commonly uh, seen resistance strategy. Uh, and what was done was then osimertinib was initiated at the acquisition of that T790M mutation. Um, so it was a different practice setting, but it's the same scientific concept. Um, so here, tumor T790M 
uh, was treated with uh, Tegrisil, and we see really significant tumor shrinkage in patients with that T790M mutation. The y-axis here is the percentage change in the tumor. Basically, no, maybe one patient had tumor that grew on the Tegresso. In a similar fashion, data from this study were broken down by liquid biopsy at the time of acquired resistance. And if we look at only plasma T790M positivity, we see the same trend with Tegresso treatment. So we've seen at the time of diagnosis and at the time of acquired resistance, in big data sets, uh, this is going to be 664 patients here, uh, very similar results when we use that liquid biopsy, uh, similar to the tumor MGS. Um, so that's the validity in the context of acquired resistance. So much so that as early as 2016, uh, this algorithm was proposed that at the time of acquired resistance to erlotinib, uh, if a liquid biopsy would be sent, and if T790M was detected, you didn't even need a biopsy. You just started your uh, next generation inhibitor. Um, so uh, that's just to say that the clinical utility at the time of diagnosis and the time of acquired resistance has been proven in the EGFR context, and we extrapolate. Now, what's on the horizon here uh, for potential clinical utility, specifically with minimal residual disease monitoring? And there's three big data sets that I'll tell you about, and then I'll dive into our Vanderbilt data set uh, and conclude. Um, so uh, in patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, uh, this was in the pre-Dervalumab era. Uh, they were treated with uh, concurrent chemo radiation uh, and had uh, circulating tumor DNA assessed at the end of treatment. Uh, now, a couple of key components, these were single center studies, um, so much smaller patient size, 40 patients. And the pattern we see when we look at circulating tumor DNA detection after curative intent therapy is replicated across multiple studies and multiple disease types. So the darker curve is CTDNA was never detected after that individual completed concurrent chemoradiation. Uh, and the red curve is patients who had CTDNA detected after concurrent chemoradiation. Uh, and this is both progression-free survival uh, and the overall disease-specific survival. So the really dramatic curve differences, and if you detect tumor DNA after curative intent therapy, uh, you're probably going to relapse and have death in the near term. Um, so the question is, can we treat this? I'll show you more data sets that show the same pattern. Nobody's proven in lung cancer that treating that MRD, MRD uh, can improve clinical outcomes. But that's where I hope we get to. So it's also been evaluated in patients with stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York put together a series of 31 of their patients who had been on immune therapy for about two years. They did a blood draw. Uh, currently in the clinic, our immune therapy regimens were studied for two years. It's a question if we should stop at that two-year time point or continue indefinitely. Um, so they looked at CTDNA at two years and saw that in individuals who had CTDNA positivity, their event-free survival, so this was progression or death, was significantly worse than patients who had clear CTDNA at that time point. Again, numbers were small though, and only four patients had positive CTDNA. Uh, so hard to draw definitive conclusions from that small data set. We've done the same thing at Vanderbilt in patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer. So a similar uh, treatment setting and even worse cure rates in the case of small cell lung cancer, only about 30% of patients are cured. So we put together 23 patients who were treated with concurrent chemo radiation and assessed their circulating tumor DNA at the end of treatment. The blue line was patients who had uh, circulating tumor DNA ever detected uh, versus the red line where circulating tumor DNA was never detected after treatment. And we see huge differences in the percentage of relapse. Um, so can we use this to make treatment decisions is the big question. And how do we make that pitch? So uh, I'll show you a couple examples uh, of how I'm making that pitch and tell you a little bit about how it goes along the way. So, um, so here's how we could use the stage four non-small cell lung cancer data set to inform a clinical trial. Uh, and one of the key points when we think about clinical trial design using circulating tumor DNA is where do we randomize? So where we randomize in this schema is going to determine which question we're answering. And I would argue the question that we need to answer with circulating tumor DNA is, does using it improve outcomes, both in terms of disease control and toxicity, compared to just not using it at all, which is our current standard of care? So um, the, the context that I 
propose this is uh, ECOG, which is one of our big cooperative groups. Um, you know, we should take patients with stage four or metastatic non-small cell who've been on immunotherapy for two years. Doesn't matter what regimen they started with, you know, they get to the two-year time point, we don't know what to do. Uh, randomize them to whatever the current standard is so that treating physician can make their choice immunotherapy or stop and surveil, uh, or do a circulating tumor DNA assessment. Um, if we detect that circulating tumor DNA, uh, basically at any degree, so 0.1% variant allele frequency is literally the lowest amount of circulating tumor DNA we can detect, um, we would continue therapy and even consider reinduction. That point was debated. Uh, and if there was no circulating tumor DNA, we would continue active surveillance for those patients because I do talk to patients about this type of design, we'd have to continue that monitoring. We wouldn't want to stop the MRD monitoring just at that one time point and, and not continue treatment. Um, so the trajectory that this experience within ECOG, um, uh, it was highly debated. Ultimately, um, it was felt that there wasn't sufficient preliminary data uh, to move with this concept. And the decision has been made to move forward with uh, just a one-to-one -one randomization to immunotherapy continuation or stop. Uh, with the CTDNA to be evaluated retrospectively. Um, so I was a little disappointed by, by that, but uh, you know, members of the group said, well, why don't you talk to the drug company and see if they'd be willing to sponsor this? Uh, so talk to Merck. Uh, they had no interest in sponsoring this currently. Uh, uh, insurance will pay if you want to continue uh, the pembrolizumab past two years, which is the most common situation. Uh, so I said, no, we'll pass on that. Uh, but talk to Regeneron. So they have Simiflimab, a competing uh, uh, immunotherapy agent that is approved for patients with PDL1 high, and they have a chemo combo coming. So they're interested. They're currently reviewing potentially uh, funding this study to start at Vanderbilt. Um, there's still multiple discussions and budget uh, to be hashed out, but um, there are avenues to try to get these uh, assessments uh, evaluated and that's what I work on most of the time when I'm not in the clinic. So a last bit about um, small cell lung cancer and kind of a little backstory uh, of how this type of work happened to lead to that data set that I showed. You know, first and foremost, it takes uh, absolutely a huge team uh, to do these collections. And the way we do it at Vanderbilt currently is uh, we have a clinical coordinator and a multiple lab members who help process. This is Monica and now uh, and Yang Jin. Uh, help, who help us consent patients and do the blood collections for these observational studies. Um, we really started dedicating uh, to longitudinal blood collections uh, at Vanderbilt uh, back in 2014. Uh, we've consented uh, 200 unique patients at this point. Uh, we collect every time they're in the clinic and willing to have a collection. Intermittently, we have patients withdraw consent so they, they don't want they want to be done with the research collections, which is fine. Um, and we have over 1,000 blood samples in these patients. Um, so that limited state small cell lung cancer data set is derived from this foundational work. Now, uh, when we talk about circulating tumor DNA in patients with small cell lung cancer, um, I just wanted to put a few slides in proving the validity because currently in practice, I, I don't send liquid biopsies in patients with small cell lung cancer. We don't have any targeted therapy, so it typically doesn't uh, influence my practice. So um, it's hard to make a case to do it in standard of care uh, for patients with small cell lung cancer. So it's actually fully in the research domain that we've observed the validity of liquid biopsies in patients with small cell lung cancer. What we know about the genetics of small cell lung cancer is it's by and large driven by TP53 and RB1 mutations. Um, so this is a massive tumor-based NGS data set in patients with small cell lung cancer. And in all the areas that are colored in are mutations in that specific gene. Um, so far and away, 70 to 90% of patients have mutations in both TP53 and RB1. So we take that into our liquid biopsies in patients with small cell lung cancer and say, if we see TP53 and RB1, then we're probably measuring those tumor mutations. And we have gone back in a few cases and looked at tumor concordance. Um, but the way we've done these analyses is, is so far we partnered with a company called Resolution Bioscience. We also do have collaborations with Garden, who's interested in this, and Tempest, who are interested in this. Most of the companies want, are willing to pay for their assay to be done for these evaluations to get their name out there as valid in the space. Um, so I haven't run into a lot of difficulty getting the companies to engage. It's just getting the specimens and making sure they're processed appropriately. That's a big lift, uh, and then getting them to the company. 
So when we looked at our first 27 patients at small cell lung uh, at Vanderbilt with small cell lung cancer, 11 had limited stage, 16 had extensive brain disease. Again, a busy slide, but the key takeaway, we see the TP53 and RB1 mutations are present in the vast majority of patients, although the percentages are a little lower than I quoted in tumor. So 70% with P53 and 52% with RB1, which is directly analogous to the slightly less sensitivity of liquid biopsies that we know. So that would be expected. Tumor, you're going to see a little bit more mutations than you're going to see in the liquid biopsy. Uh, and we, when we look at the individual level, uh, we see that tracing the circulating tumor DNA over time predicts clinical outcome. And this is what led to us putting together the previous data cohort that I showed. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit more background and then wrap up. Uh, but we see that uh, the circulating tumor DNA in this patient with small cell lung cancer was predominantly the, this TP53 mutation. Uh, and we see that over time, which is on the x-axis here, uh, the patient was treated with carboplatin and etoposide. They fully cleared their circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and then about 200 days into their therapy, when the CT scan looked pretty good, we didn't have evidence of recurrence on the CT. We already saw that P53 mutation popping back up, but current standard of care was just observation. So you know, the key question is, can we act on it at that time point and improve clinical outcomes? Uh, subsequently, the uh, variant allele frequency of that P53 jumped way up, uh, and the patient had uh, pancytopenia, actually marrow recurrence of their small cell was really bad, and they were, and they passed away without further treatment. So, you know, a small cell trajectory that's not only found the disease uh, goes away seemingly completely, and then it comes back very uh, aggressively, and it's very hard to treat at that point. When we looked across our whole group of small cell lung cancer patients, we saw that nine had rises in their tumor DNA prior to the radiographic progression. Um, two had rises that clarified ambiguous CT findings, the clinical reality we all face all too often. Uh, how do we interpret, especially you know, those post-radiation changes? Is this disease recurrence? I think CT DNA could be really helpful there. Uh, and then eight patients had rises that coincided with progression on imaging. And we, when we look at the amount of tumor DNA in small cell lung cancer versus non-small cell lung cancer, there's actually a lot more tumor DNA that we can identify in the blood in patients with small cell lung cancer compared to non-small cell lung cancer. So the main takeaway from this slide is when we think about MRD monitoring in patients with lung cancer as a whole, I think small cell lung cancer is a perfect model. And the hypothesis of the study uh, that I showed of the limited stage small cell lung cancer patients was that circulating tumor DNA could provide insight into which patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer were cured or not. Uh, in the clinic, they look the same, but we know that 30% of the patients are cured and 70% will have lethal relapse. So can circulating tumor DNA uh, inform us as to which patients may benefit from further therapy? I'll skip through a few more of the background slides and conclude with a trial that I uh, also have taken forward again through ECOG and again through drug companies and tell you a little bit of that story and then that'll be it. Um, so here's what we, what we could do in patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer. Um, so if a patient, let's say they're diagnosed with limited stage small cell lung cancer, they get definitive concurrent chemoradiation. Surgery is almost never an option in limited stage small cell lung cancer. It's usually too advanced for that to be on the table. Um, but then we would test their circulating tumor DNA. And if we detected their circulating tumor DNA at any variant allele frequency, we would administer an immune checkpoint inhibitor. If we didn't, uh, then we would uh, just continue uh, the CTDNA monitoring. Uh, and it, it, if at any point they detected a circulating tumor DNA, we would institute uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so I also took this to ECOG and saying, no, we should do this study. We have this data set showing that uh, liquid biopsy results in patients with small cell lung cancer can tell us who's going to recur and die. I said, oh, you know, that's a great idea. Uh, we have another study already looking at atezolizumab in patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer uh, at the time of concurrent chemoradiation and then adjuvant. Uh, so you run into a limited resource issue when you're trying to get these studies done uh, through big cooperative groups in the National Cancer Institute. But, you know, Sam, like, well, why don't you talk to Merck? So here Merck said, oh, um, that would be uh, interesting just because they have pembrolizumab, uh, but not in small cell lung cancer. 
And pembrolizumab and small cell lung cancer hasn't had as good of a story as it has in non-small cell. Um, so it turns out they were interested uh, and, and have uh, supported this, but to a slightly different approach um, that kind of encapsulates the tension in trying to get these studies done. Um, so in discussions with Merck, they said, this is a great idea. And I think, I think liquid biopsy has huge potential. We should, uh, we should capture that information. Uh, but why don't we treat everybody with Keytruda? Um, and then we'll just look at the liquid biopsy results uh, retrospectively. Um, so that, that actually is a study that's about to open as a single center so far uh, at Vanderbilt, where we'll treat all patients with Keytruda. Uh, and then we'll look at the liquid biopsy results retrospectively. Um, I think there's potential in the extensive stage setting. Um, due to time, I won't uh, you know, show all the, all the trials that I'm pitching all the time to use circulating tumor DNA in the clinic. Uh, but I'll sum it up in conclusion that I think liquid biopsies have the potential sh to shift the paradigm of cancer care. And when I think about the use of liquid biopsies in the clinic, particularly in the MRD or post-curative intent setting, if we use that to determine who needs treatment, not only can we improve outcomes for those patients who need the treatment, we can reduce toxicity for the patients who don't need treatment. I think that's a fundamental paradigm shift that I'm always trying to get out there that uh, liquid biopsy use is it's really different than a new drug evaluation where we're always having to trade off toxicity and efficacy. Uh, we want more efficacy, but we know we're going to get more toxicity. This is fundamentally different. And so I think as a field, we need to invest more in these types of evaluations to improve our patient outcomes. Um, so these are the announcements to huge teams. I just mentioned the on-the-ground coordinators so far, uh, but there is a lot of lab-based researchers and clinical investigators um, who open the door to these types of studies. Uh, we have gotten funding from the NIH, Conquer Cancer Foundation, uh, NCCN Foundation to do this work uh, and really keep it going. So uh, it's a continuous process where we're uh, trying to keep it all going. Thank you. so much for speaking, Dr. Ang. Um, I just want to have a quick little reminder. We have your CNE credit in your folder. So if you want CNE credit, please fill that out and put it on the table on your way out. Um, and Dr. Chisholm is going to come up here and we're going to give our clinical trial champion award. Thank you, Dr. Lines. Thank you for all our guest speakers for the second annual uh, did it, I think everyone learned something tonight. Uh, it's fascinating how things are changing at such a rapid pace for lung cancer. We're looking forward for uh, more participation across across centers here through Thompson. Uh, so I would like to, at this time, present the award uh, for the person uh, over the last year who have uh, committed to the cruel process for clinical trials have uh, shown tremendous uh, enthusiasm. I think sometimes even if you can't get a person on trial, it helps to identify a patient or refer them over to me and, and I will enroll them. And, and so Dr. Tony DeSava, he kind of put to me that I like to take to make it for your friends. That's a clinical trial champion award for 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time and coming out for our clinical trial symposium. We're very excited to host it. Um, in your folder, there's also a packet, or there's also a paper that has our clinical trial. There's a QR code on there, and you can check it out of the clinical trials that we have and the ones we're offering and see if your patients might be eligible. Thank you so much for coming.